Good morning. It's about time for us to get started with our class. I hate to break up all of the good fellowship. It's, uh, I know it's really encouraging for us to get to spend time together, so I hate to, to break up the, the, our, our visiting, but it's time for us to get going with our, uh, with our class. Uh, up to this point, we've, we've, been, uh, we've started a study on uh, encouragement and being encouragers, and we've talked about uh, several topics that are related to uh, specifically the attitude of an encourager. Um, you know, understanding that it is a biblical ministry. We looked at the commands that we have to encourage each other. We looked at the biblical examples of encouragement that we see through the, uh, both the Old and New Testaments. Uh, we've looked at the, uh, the power that it has to, uh, to have courage. We looked at the problem of discouragement and what that can cause. Uh, and then we looked last week at the possibilities of encouragement and some things that we can do to encourage others. This week we're going to be starting the, the next major section of this study, looking at the anatomy of an encourager. And just, uh, I, know, I think I mentioned this when we started the study, but just to, um, to, to remind everyone, the, the outline that I'm using for this and the material that I'm, uh, that I'm using here largely, I'm supplementing it some with my own, but Largely, I'm using the, the book called The Barnabas Factor. Uh, if anyone is, is interested in reading along, it's a very good resource. I would be glad to, to share more information on that. Uh, uh, afterward, if, uh, if you'll come see me afterward, I can show you where to get that. I believe it's by, uh, off the top of my head, I believe it's Aubrey Johnson that wrote that book. But it is a, a very good one. Uh, but we're going to be looking at this morning, as we look at the anatomy of an encourager, We'll start with the mind of an encourager. What does somebody who is an encouraging person, how do they think? Where do they put their mind? What do they dwell on? And so that's what our discussion this morning is going to be about. And so as we begin our, our time together, would you bow with me and we'll start with a word of prayer. Our Father, we love you and we thank you that you allow us to, to call out to you as, as Father. Father, we thank you that, uh, that we have the status of being your children. It is such a privilege. We thank you that you hear and that you answer. And Father, I thank you for each one who's here this morning. Father, it's an encouragement for us just to get to be together and to spend time visiting with each other and uh, hopefully building each other up, Father. And I pray that as we go through our study this morning that, you would, uh, that we would each be built up, that, that we would be challenged, Father, that we would uh, grow to be more like you would want us to be, Father, that, we would, uh, that it would, the result is that we would be transformed to be more like Jesus as a result of what we learn. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. And so the mind of an encourager, encouragement is something that it takes intent, it takes focus, it takes, you know, because you look around at our world, you look at, you turn on the news, you turn on whatever else it is, but it's discouraging. And if we're not careful, we can slip into having that discouraged and discouraging attitude uh, and outlook. And so it's something that takes intent. Um, and so we'll be looking at how an encourager thinks. One of the first main goals in being an encourager, one of our main goals in, in encouraging others is to change how they think, to have a positive impact on their outlook, on how they think. And if we are too encouraged, then we've got to, uh, we ourselves have to have the right kind of outlook. We have to look into how we think ourselves. And the mind is an incredibly powerful part of our bodies to the point that our thinking can affect our physical, our emotional, uh, and even cognitive condition and abilities. Uh, there are some diseases and health issues that can be rooted in our thoughts. Fear, anxiety, uh, and guilt can cause, can cause physical health problems if we allow them to get carried away. You know, there's a... Uh, <clears throat> There's a number of things, for instance, you know, stress has a number of associated problems with it. Uh, emotional problems, if you're really stressed, it can cause you to be easily agitated or to feel overwhelmed like you're just losing control. Uh, you can have difficulty relaxing. Stress can have uh, physical issues. It can manifest itself through low energy and headaches, uh, upset stomach and other issues, as well as insomnia, or, and in some cases, more frequent colds and infections. If you're constantly stressed, you can, uh, it can bring on cognitive issues as well for, through forgetfulness and disorganization. Uh, and if, these can even have long-term effects. 
uh, in mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, personality disorders, uh, high blood pressure, and things like that. And so our, the mind is very important that we get it right. But what effect do you think someone filled with these kinds of things, these kinds of thoughts, is going to have on others? Is this going to be the kind of person that's encouraging and exciting to be around all the time? And so if we're going to be encouraging to others, then we've got to take control of our thoughts and our minds. Because someone who thinks like this is not going to be typically an encourager. We would do well to take into account what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Let's open our Bibles now and we'll begin in Matthew chapter 6. In the context here, Jesus has been talking about, uh, or He's been contrasting earthly treasures and heavenly treasures. And He tells the people in the Sermon on the Mount, He's talking about what it means to be a person of the kingdom. And beginning in verse 25, He says, Therefore, I, or for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink uh, or what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And so Jesus uses a, a lesser to greater argument here, saying don't worry. Don't allow these things to fill your mind. Don't allow the physical things that you need to be what's capturing. If you're a person of the kingdom of God, you put your trust in Him. And what He'll say a little bit further on, we're not going to read this far down, but verse 33, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But notice specifically what He says in verse 27 about worry, about anxiety. Who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? What does worry ever do for us? Have you ever gone back to a situation, I'm so glad that I got worried about that. <laughs> Usually, I find myself looking back saying, if I hadn't gotten so worried, I would have been able to think more clearly and would have made a better decision. If I hadn't gotten so worried, I would have gotten a better night's sleep and I would feel better. If I hadn't been so worried, I wouldn't have gotten so angry whenever I shouldn't have. Who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And the answer is no one. Worry and anxiety doesn't really do anything for us. It doesn't add to our lives. But if we look at the effects that worry and anxiety can have, you know, just look at it from a medical perspective, it can certainly take away. Physically, emotion, uh, emotionally, cognitively, it can take away uh, from the relationships that we have. It can have negative effects. But it doesn't add a single thing. It doesn't help in any way. That's why the Apostle Peter would write in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. We have one that we can go to and we can bring our anxieties. He listens, He cares, He can handle whatever problem we have and yet we just we fret about these things that come up. Oh, what am I going to do about this? The first thing that I ought to do about this is hand it over to the one who can handle it. Denny? That's exactly right. Denny, Denny mentions here that the, the more we worry about things, the, it erodes our faith because the, if we're not casting it on Him, we're not trusting Him to take care of it, we're carrying it around, we're carrying it around ourselves. And to, to extend from that, once you have given something over to the Lord, don't pick that anxiety back up. That, that demonstrates a lack of faith. I've given that to Him. If you give something over to Him, trust Him with it. That doesn't mean that you don't make plan or that you don't ever think about it. But there's a difference in thinking through something and having anxiety and worry. Bill? Uh, I don't know what this uh, paying attention but what worry also does. What's your name again, sir? <laughs> That part won't go on to the recording. It wasn't in the microphone, so... <laughs> My bad. <laughs> what I was saying is that worry also keeps us self-centered. A big portion of what Jesus is, and the apostles are asking us to do is to worry about other people, put other people ahead of ourselves. So when we're inward-focused or worried about ourselves, we're not worried about other people. We're not putting other people ahead of ours, ourselves. Yes, and that ties that directly to what we're talking about here because our goal is to be able to, ultimately what we're doing is how do we encourage one another? And if we're self-centered, 
We're not going to encourage one another. If we're worried and anxious, the interactions we're going to have with others is likely going to have the opposite effect. But as we cast our anxieties onto Him, we can encourage others to do the same. We have the peace about us. We have the, uh, the lack of anxiety about us to be able to, to be a benefit to other people. Cast your anxieties on Him. Prayer is a great outlet for stress and anxiety. If you ever have something that's got you just so worked up and you spend five, ten minutes in prayer talking to God about it, and you find the whole rest of the day, it's like a weight has been lifted. It's not that it, the, the problem doesn't exist anymore, but that you trust, you know that God has this. We can stop worrying about it. He'll handle whatever we... Uh, Whatever comes our way, He has the ability to handle. There's no problem so small that He doesn't care and no problem so big that He doesn't have the ability to take care of it. We can cast all of our anxieties on Him. In Proverbs chapter 17, in verse 22, Solomon had something to say on the subject as well. Where he says, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Uh, there's a connection between a person's uh, mental and physical well-being. The Bible tells us this. The modern medicine, can you can see this. And if we think about it in our own lives, our own experience will tell us this too. We get too worried, worked up about something going on. We get our mind set in the wrong place. It can make us physically ill. And so it's so important that we get our minds right for a number of reasons, but, you know, as... One of those being so that we can have the right impact that God tells us to on the people around us. Denny? You see, one of the biggest drugs sold, you see it advertised on TV all the time, is antidepressants. So worry and anxiety is going to create depression, and that depression is going to affect everybody around you also. That's absolutely right. Denny mentions, uh, you know, the, so many antidepressants that are, that are so I'll tell you, one of the greatest antidepressants are a couple of them. Like we've mentioned here, giving your anxieties over to the Lord and spending time around God's people. Just being, I mean, in this atmosphere that we're in, being able to, to have a serious discussion, but where we can also laugh and enjoy one another's company as well. Yeah, hey, that just that just sets the whole day, the rest of the day up to be good, to be around one another and to uh, to discuss God's word, to spend time in prayer with him. Uh, such a wonderful thing. Uh, Jason? So generally, generationally, we have gotten to a point where we are not good with sitting, sitting with any sort of unpleasantry, right? So when the worry overcomes us, the first things that my generation does is we grab a cell phone, we grab a video game, we do something to distract ourselves from the life that we're actually having to live through. Right. And so I think it was already said, I think it's perfect that, you know, when you're able to give that over to God, whether it's on awakening or going to bed or when you're in the fight of the moment, you know, that's when you find that true reprieve. But when we distract ourselves from from life's upsetness, then we've done nothing but just build it. And then that creates the ruminating factor. So as you mentioned, the distractions and the like you say, putting it off, you might even say in some cases it's a procrastination of dealing with it. As you said, whatever way we're choosing to do that, it doesn't go away and in some cases can even make it uh, more worrisome later on. And what you were saying there reminds me of what Paul said to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 4 uh, and verses 6 and 7, where he said, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now before we get to verse 7, and that's going to be one of the keys there, a couple of things here. Don't be anxious about anything. What's the solution? Take it to God. It's what we've already seen with Peter. But it's really interesting here, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. One of the best ways to turn a, you know, a, a, a bad attitude, if I find that I've got a bad attitude about something, if I'm not feeling really well about something, is to look around and go, okay, I'm dwelling on all the negative, but what are some things that I can be thankful for? Because the truth is, even on my worst day, I've got a lot to be thankful for. And when you start thinking about what you do have rather than what you don't have, or the things that are going right rather than the things that are going wrong, it helps to keep a balance. It helps to bring back the joy. 
In verse 7, it says, uh, you're saying here, you let your, uh, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's better than any antidepressants you can get at the pharmacy. Larry? I think a really important point, right before verse 6, the end of verse 5, uh, Paul says, the Lord is near. Hmm. That's a, a good point there. The Lord is near. So take your request to Him. It, is, it just adds to that. It gives, you know, He hears. He listens. He answers. You don't have any reason to have the anxiety. If He's near... There is a peace, and it is a peace that is beyond what we can grasp, what we can completely comprehend. It's a great thing to pray to alleviate your anxieties. One thing I've been trying to do now that I haven't always been good at is when we do pray and when God answers and helps us out, I didn't always go back and thank God for answering my prayers. It's kind of like the ten lepers that went, when after they were healed by Christ and only one came back to thank, thank him for it. So I th I'm trying to be better at that, thanking him for answering my prayers. Such an important point there, and it's you know, going along with what we saw there in Philippians, with, let your request be made on with thanksgiving, that we go back, that we recognize, because that, you know, on top of the, the answers that he gives, when we go back and we're thankful for it, it has that much more of an effect on us in helping to build us up. And so such a, such a wonderful point, so important that we remember when God answers our prayers to go back and tell Him thank you. And especially sometimes whenever He answers the prayer, but it wasn't the answer that we were expecting to say thank you, that although I might not understand why, He has the best, he has the best solution, the best outcome in mind, to be thankful anyway, to be thankful in all things. And that really helps us in uh, getting rid of anxiety and helping us to have the joy that is uh, well, the fruit of the Spirit. There is, uh, it helps us to have the joy and the peace that in turn will allow us to be people who can encourage others. You know, Because that's, again, what we're after here is becoming the kind of people that can enjoy others. And when we are thankful, joy-filled people, rather than anxiety, worry-filled people, we can have that effect on others because joy and, uh, and thankfulness, that's contagious. But so is grouchiness. We've got to be careful. What are we spreading? Now, we've all heard the phrase here, you know, as we, if we talk about the mind of an encourager, we've all heard the phrase, you are what you eat. You know, and if people will use that talking about how we need to be careful about what we put into our bodies because, you know, if we eat junk food, we're not going to be very healthy. Well, we think about this and you know in our context here in a lot of ways you are what you think you are what you put into your mind jesus understood and taught about this connection let's go now to mark chapter 7 and we'll begin there in verse 14 mark 7 we'll look at verses 14 to 23 it says after he called the crowd to him again he began saying to them listen to me all of you and understand there's nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable, and he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it, goes into, uh, because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated. Now, Jesus here is not talking about what you put into the mind. He clarifies it here. He's specifically talking about what goes into the man. He's talking about food. He said, that's not what's going to defile. Thus, it says he declared all foods clean. He was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things proceed from within and defile the man. We speak from that which fills the heart, he says. And so we have to be careful. You know, he's not talking about the physical. He's talking about what's in your heart. 
What are we putting in our heart? This goes beyond, you know, the Jews were here who he's talking to. They were worried about defiling themselves with food. Jesus is talking about something much deeper, much more important, didn't he? You know, just the fact that he mentions these things tells you that the opposite is also can be true. The opposite can also be put into your heart if you will allow it. So the warning to put these in there tells you to watch out for the other. Yes, we have to be careful there of what we put into our hearts and our minds. You know, have you noticed that the things that you listen to and watch come back out sometimes? Sometimes things that you didn't really want to. You know, if you spend time in God's Word, if you're reading, for example, if you're going through our daily Bible reading schedule where we're reading through the Bible in a year together, you'll find that whenever, it, whenever it's needed, whenever, you know, if you're facing a difficult situation, a temptation, if you've been storing up God's Word, if you've been reading it, you can call it to mind when you need it. There it is. You've stored that up in your heart and mind. But if what you're listening to and watching is ungodly stuff, you find that that's what comes to your mind when you face different situations. What are you storing up? What are you putting into your heart and mind? Uh, you know, if you read the news, uh, it's hard not to have a pessimistic view of society and, and everything going on around us. It's hard to read and watch without getting anxious or angry, worried, or getting upset. It's hard not to read the news sometimes and maybe, well, every problem that we've got is that person's fault or that group's fault. Because it, you know, it seems to just be all bad news. It's pessimistic. You know, Paul taught on this principle of you are what you think to the Philippians. Now, this was a church that was divided and quarreling to the point that Paul, uh, he didn't do this very often in his letters, but he does with the Philippians. He calls out two faithful members of that church for causing a problem, for causing division. They were unable to live in harmony. There was a division in that church that could be traced back to these two individuals, and it appears that that division was spreading throughout the church by the time of the letter, because this whole letter, he's encouraging unity. He's encouraging humility. He's reminding them to look at the big picture. We're citizens of heaven. We're waiting for the Lord to come back. This is what's really important. All the way through, what's his favorite word or couple of words throughout Philippians? Rejoice. Joy. Because in a church that's dealing with that, there's not much rejoicing. There's not going to be much joy. But he gives them one really important uh, instruction. If we go back to Philippians chapter 4 again, we read verses 6 and 7 a minute ago talking about how we uh, change our way of thinking by turning our, uh, our concerns and our anxieties over to the Lord. He tells them in verses 6 and 7, when you have negative, when you have anxiety, when you have struggles, turn it over to the Lord. And then he gives them a positive instruction in verse 8. <clears throat> Instead of thinking about these anxieties, instead of thinking about the problems, instead of thinking about all of this stuff, verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, uh, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. He says, here's where you set your mind. Or he would say to the Colossians, set your mind on things above where Christ is, not on the things of the world. One of the ways that he tells them to correct the problem is through changed thinking. The theme of, having, uh, of the importance of having the right mindset is all over the New Testament. Colossians 3, 1 through 4, set your mind on things above. Set your mind on where Christ is. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he talks about transformation. He talks about sacrificing ourselves to God and he tells there exactly how to do that. Romans 12, 1 and 2, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. He says, I'm urging you to give yourself completely to God. Why? Because God is merciful. Because God has saved, and that's what he spent the first 11 chapters of this book dealing with, the mercy of God, the goodness of God, the fact that we can be counted righteous on the basis of Jesus. Here's why. Because of the mercies of God, give yourself completely to Him as a living and holy sacrifice. 
How do, we, how do we change like that? How do we give ourselves to Him? Verse 2. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. How do we give ourselves to Him? How do we change who we are? How are we transformed? It's by a transformed, changed thinking. Denny? Back to Philippians 4, and verse 13. I can do all things through Him. So many times people wonder, can I make that change? Can I do that? It looks too hard to me. <clears throat> if you're a Christian, you can do all things because he is there and he will help with the, the strength and power that he talks about in Colossians also. We can get through whatever situation's thrown our way because of him. That's, uh, and that's right. We can, uh, you know, but he, he talks here about the importance, like you said, changing our, our thinking. That's how we get through because we're, we're dwelling on Him. We're keeping our thoughts, uh, our hearts focused on Him is how we can get through things. But how we are transformed starts in the mind. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says the same thing to the Ephesians as well. And I'm, the reason I'm reading multiple of these is for emphasis, to show this is... This comes up again and again and again. And when we see something repeated over and over, I mean, it only takes once in God's Word for it to be true and important. When we see something repeated over and over and over again, we really need to take note. And in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 21, he says, If you've heard, uh, heard Him and have been taught in Him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. Okay, so he, he gives a couple of instructions here. He's going to say a little further down, verse 24, he will say, put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. He gives the instructions, you put off the sin, you put off all of these things and what he said in the preceding verses, beginning about verse 17. He has a list of these things. Put all of this off. Put on the new self, and he's going to describe in verse 25 what this looks like. Laying aside the sins and doing things like being kind to one another, being honest with one another, being edifying to one another. But there's a really important phrase, a really important thing that he says in verse 23 as to how we do that. That you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do you put off the old self? How do you become the new self? You've got to start thinking like the new self. You've got to start thinking, setting your mind on things above. We won't act differently until we think differently. We're not going to behave like the new man if we still, uh, if we still think like the old one. On the day of Pentecost, Peter proclaimed to the Jews in Jerusalem, those who had come from all over, he proclaimed to them there that they had killed the Messiah. And they realized what they'd done. Uh, when they realized their guilt, they asked, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized. Now that term that is translated as repent is the Greek word metanoeo. It, is, uh, it means primarily to change the mind. Now, there is another word in the New Testament that's also translated repent in, in other contexts that has more to do with the behavior specifically, but they're not unrelated to one another. The first thing the people had to do there was to change their thinking about Jesus because prior to this, what did they think of Jesus? Who did they think He was? An imposter. What did they think Jesus was? This was going to lead a, lead a revolution to, to uh, you know, help them. Uh, and uh, in a physical way, not spiritual way. There's always looking for, for him to, uh, to fight, physically fight, raise his army, and uh, defeat the, uh, the Romans who, uh, who had kept them uh, imprisoned, so to speak. That's, who they, that's what they thought, even to the end, as a matter of fact. You know, they really didn't understand what he had come for. He was talking about a spiritual kingdom. Now, they thought he was going to lead them in, in a fight for a physical uh, kingdom. And so, you know, that's the, 
That's the point that I think most of them felt about Jesus. And they were disappointed at first, uh, you know, until they really understood uh, the spiritual aspect of what he was teaching. Okay, so they had the wrong concept of, of the Messiah. And so whenever he didn't come and do what they thought he was supposed to do, he ended up getting himself killed by the Jews. What did these Jews here on Pentecost, what had they thought Jesus was? The, the reason they put him to death? A heretic. They thought he was a blasphemer. It says in John chapter 8, Jesus, you know, they asked him, well, you're not 50 years old. You saying Abraham? He said, before Abraham was born, I am. It says they picked up stones to throw at him. And Peter here shows from prophecy in Acts chapter 2, He's not a blasphemer. He is exactly who he said he was. He's seated at the right hand of God. He's both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. What do we do? The first thing they had to do was change the way they thought about him. Their previous way of thinking about him, he's a blasphemer, a heretic. You know, you remember whenever Pilate washed, uh, washed his hands, said, I'm innocent of this man's blood, and the people's response, well, let his blood be on us and on our children. They didn't see him as some innocent, sinless individual. When Peter tells the people to repent, the first thing they've got to do is recognize who Jesus truly is to change their thinking. Now, that's going to have implications on the direction of their life. That doesn't stop with just the mind, but the mind is where it starts. Our thinking has to change, didn't he? That's what I was thinking. You mentioned a repetitive pattern of thought. And all through John's writings, he talks about other people, not about himself. And when, when your mind changes to be more in line with what God wants your mind to be, it not only helps you, but other people who are watching see that. So the effect of encouragement is not only as an individual, but as an effect on society in general. That's it. And that's exactly where we're going with this, is we get our mind right. It's going to affect our behavior, it's going to affect our lifestyle, and it's going to affect how we interact with the people around us. If we're going to encourage people, we've got to get our thinking right. We've got to get our thinking right about God. We've got to get uh, our thinking right about our circumstances. You know, in dealing with the Corinthian church, Paul told them to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We have to choose what we're going to dwell on. You know, thoughts pop into our heads sometimes, but we can choose whether or not they stay there. We can choose whether we're going to dwell on it or dwell on something else. The way Satan often works is to get us to dwell on something sinful so that we'll give in, to just keep thinking about it, keep justifying it, and keep rolling it around in our minds again and again and again. What's James say in James chapter 1? Each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own desires. And when lust leads to sin and sin leads to death. But you know, if we stop it right there when we think about it, take every thought captive. Be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. Quiet the mind. Yes, quiet the mind. Turn our mind towards God. But you know, so often that's, that's the, the battle that Satan wages is in the mind. Where are we dwelling on? You know, we've been talking about spiritual warfare and the tactics that, that Satan uses against us. He tries to discourage us. That's so much a, he's waging war in our own minds. We're waging war against him in our thinking. So we have to be intentional. We have to train our minds to be Godly, as Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16, prepare your minds for action. And then he gives the charge later, be holy because I'm holy. How do we prepare our minds? It comes down to what we think about, what we put into our minds, what we dwell on. What are we listening to? What habits are we forming? Are we making it a habit to be thankful for what we do have or to complain and be upset about what we don't. To make it a habit of praying, especially praying when we may not feel like praying. 
Because you could argue that that's when we need it the most. And to pray even for, or maybe especially for, the people that we have the hardest time with. So if we're going to be encouraging to others, we have to be careful of that, we're, uh, that we get ourselves in the right mindset. That we can control, that we take our thoughts captive. Our goal is to instill hope in others so that they can achieve, so that they can become more of what God has called them to be. But if our thinking is messed up, if our thinking about God isn't right, if our thinking about our circumstances isn't right, we're going to drag people down rather than build them up. Vinny? I was thinking about Paul when he was in chains. What a depressing place to be and how he could have become depressed over that. And instead of that, instead of thinking about himself, Everything he wrote was to encourage other people. In encouraging the other people, he encouraged himself and kept away from depression. So in, unless we actively take a part in encouraging others and encouraging ourselves, we're going to end up in depression. Follow the example of Paul. Yes, uh, some, uh, some good points there for us to, uh, to think on. Um, we have to be careful there of, of what we're putting into our minds. If we're going to be encouraging, it, it starts with our own thinking. Because our goal is to, to affect the thinking and the outlook of others. It means we've got to get our own thinking and our own outlook under control. We've got to take our own thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Encouragement is not something that, that happens naturally for everyone. And as we look around at our world, sometimes you might even say it's kind of goes against what we see around us. It takes work to be an encourager. It takes intent to be an encourager. It takes the work to put the right things into our minds and to transform our minds, to train our minds for godliness and right thinking. Yes. It's like what we mentioned earlier. She, you know, she says here that you know, we just need to sometimes let go, let God do the work. It, you know, it's like what Peter said. We cast our anxieties on Him. Turn our issues over to Him. Trust in Him. But have we trained our minds to think in that way? And when we get our minds trained to think right, we will be able to have the positive impact to encourage those around us to think right. We will be able to do what the Bible says, to encourage one another, to spur one another on to love and good deeds. But if I'm filled with discouragement and anger and frustration, that's what we need to let go of. Uh, but if I'm filled with those things, that's what I'm going to be pouring into others. If we're going to be encouragers. We've got to fill ourselves and our minds with the right things. Uh, Bill? We've developed uh, all kinds of coping mechanisms for all kinds of things, right? You've got an anger problem. There's a coping mechanism and how to deal through that. You've got a substance abuse problem. There's, there's things that you can do. Uh, God's given us coping mechanisms. He tells us to count our blessings like you were talking about when we're in that mindset, start thinking about what is good in our life, what is a blessing in our life. <clears throat> Leslie was singing a song a minute ago that on your worst day, you're a child of God. So to keep that in your mind and use that as a, uh, an encouragement for others when you see them down in the dumps too. Mm -hmm. That's right. In order to be an encourager, we have to keep our mind right so that we're thinking on the positive, thinking on, like you say, what we have to be thankful for, keeping our mind focused on Him. And so the mind of an encourager, if we're going to be encouragers, we've got to get our thinking right, put the right things into our minds so that we're people who are filled with joy. And then we can pour that into and, and share that with others. We're going to continue on next week looking at other parts of the encourager. We'll talk about the eyes uh, and the, the hands, the, you know, and, uh, the ears of an encourager uh, in the weeks to come. I appreciate everyone's uh, comments and our discussion this morning. Let's uh, finish up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that, um, for the encouragement that you give us through Jesus Christ. Father, for the ways that you've given us in your word that you tell us about to change our outlook and to, to transform our thinking. And Father, I pray that we would be a people with transformed, uh, renewed minds, Father, so that we can encourage and build up others around us. Father, I pray that we would be people who take our thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ because sometimes we, uh, thoughts come into our minds that, that aren't right, Father. And I pray that we would take control of, of our thoughts so that we dwell on what's good and what's right. 
And Father, I pray ultimately that we would become more like Jesus, which starts with a new way of thinking so that we can affect others positively. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.